every single one of them is in cahoots. He runs the USA, he's running Russia too. He's a white man in a business suit. Well, I went to the stream to get a little drink. Well, it was dark and dead, and it sure did stink. I went upstream to find the source of the spill. There was a chemical plant on top of a hill. My name is Greg Yelich. I'm a coordinator of the Committee for Peace in Yugoslavia. We're based in Columbus, Ohio. Um, during the Vietnam War, I was active in demonstrations against the Vietnam War. And uh, similarly, when uh, President Bush was bombing Iraq, I was very active in that anti-war effort also. Um, during the uh, Civil War, Yugoslav Civil War, uh, I was again active in uh, the peace movement. But this was a rather different circumstance. The uh, peace movement I'd worked with in Iraq was completely absent. In fact, most of them favored bombing. So we had to basically create our own new peace movement. And um, also, in contrast to earlier uh, American interventions, where you had many good people doing research and writing on the subject, there was nothing available. So I found that I had to do my own research. And it's been very time consuming, uh, 20, 30 hours, even more uh, per week just on research for years now. Yeah. Uh, why I feel passionately? Well, I'm of Serbian descent. Uh, but uh, so I have basically two motivations from my anti war background and also because I'm Serbian descent. So this one has a very personal uh, um, dimension for me that uh, I feel very strongly about. Uh, now that I'm here, and uh, as a as a media person, um, as somebody interested in language, and how language is tied to uh, our identity of ourselves and our knowledge of the world, the the language uh, because it's in Cyrillic, mo most a lot of it is uh, written in Cyrillic. It is very, very different. It's, uh, well, I mean, you might compare it to Vietnam uh, in that it's a very, very foreign language. And I think that that language uh, allows the United States to more easily vilify uh, the culture because it's like, um, it sort of sends up, a, sends up a red flag to the American people. Eh, these people are so different than we are, we don't have to know about them, we don't have to care about them, you know, it's like, uh, do you know what I'm saying? No, I know what you're saying. Well, actually, I'd say it's broader than that. Based on my experience, uh, most Americans have that attitude towards any foreign people, even next door in Mexico, uh, complete indifference. And I think, I've wondered why that is many times, and I, I think one aspect might be that growing up, children are told over and over and over, the you know, United States is the best country in the world, no other country can compare. So people grew up with an arrogant attitude that they can learn, not, no other country has anything that could teach them, that they have the best of everything, so it's not even worth looking into other cultures and peoples, what their lives are like, or what we could learn from them. And of course, uh, this is nonsense, and uh, why is it nonsense? Well, every people has a very rich and, and uh, a culture of their own, right? And um, no matter, I've traveled extensively, and everywhere I travel, I just, I just, to me, each culture is absolutely beautiful and has a depth and new things that I've never encountered before that I can learn from. It's just, to me, the diversity and the sheer richness of, of humanity all over the globe is something to be celebrated and to explore and enjoyed, not to be ignored and um, looked down upon history of this region is um, more similar to a third world history than it is to say a Western European history. It's a history of colonial oppression and people here I believe rightfully see this as another battle against uh, colonial power trying to impose its will on the region. Um, going back to 1389, the very important event in the history of uh, Serbian people was the Battle of Kosovo where the Serbian forces lost to Turkish forces and uh, five centuries of oppression under the Ottoman Empire resulted. So the, their whole history basically was under the Ottoman Empire. Um, areas of the Serbian area of Vojvodina, um, Bosnia, well, most of Bosnia-Herzegovina 
was under the Ottoman Empire, but uh, Slovenia, Croatia, they were under the Austria, Austro-Hungarian Empire for, for centuries too, so they had their own history of colonial oppression. Um, in 1908, uh, well, the late 19th century, the uh, Serbs managed to free themselves from the Ottoman Empire uh, through uh, armed conflict. And in 1908, um, Bosnia-Herzegovina, which had also freed itself, uh, was annexed by Austria-Hungary. Um, and Austria-Hungary was had its eyes on grabbing Serbia as well, and uh, basically that is the cause of World War One. Um, and during World War One, the Serbian people lost. If you look at the um, uh, casualty figures, you'll see a very striking uh, figure for Serbia. They lost one quarter of their entire population killed. Almost half of their military force was killed. And I don't know if you ever looked at casualty figures during wars, but this is quite remarkable of a figure. I mean, I don't know of any war, any people who suffered as much casualties in a war as that. Uh, World War II, again, they were invaded by uh, Germany and uh, Italy and other Axis powers. And uh, in Croatia, there was a puppet government uh, run by the Ustashi, which is a fascist force. And um, they uh, killed over one million Serbs, Jews, Roma, Roma people, communists, in the most horrible ways. So there was this absolutely ugly uh, conflict during World War II. So Yugoslav uh, partisan forces under the leadership of Tito, it was the most effective uh, resistance force in all of Europe, um, as opposed to, say, a regular army. And uh, they managed to free most of Yugoslavia by the end of the war through their own effort. Uh, since then, um, they, had, they developed their economy after the war and made great strides. And in Eastern Europe, they had the most developed economy, with maybe the possible exception of the German Democratic Republic. But um, their system was um, much more relaxed and open than the other Eastern European countries. Um, with the demise of the Soviet Union in 1991 um, and all the rest of the socialist countries in Eastern Europe in 1989, that left Yugoslavia as the last socialist country in Europe. And um, that was basically when, the, well, even went back to 1990, the West made strong efforts to overturn the economy and impose their own uh, economic system on Yugoslavia. In 1990, um, Congress passed this law that uh, cut off all, threatened to cut off all aid and economic activity with Yugoslavia unless they agreed to new elections. And, but there were terms under these elections. The elections could not take place under, on the federal level they could only take place on the level of each separate republic. And that, of course, was to encourage secession. And the uh, U.S. Um, government and uh, Germany pumped millions and millions of dollars into the campaigns of right-wing and even fascist forces. And in the uh, 1990 elections, uh, they got their way almost everywhere except Serbia and Montenegro, where the socialists won the election. And uh, that is why Serbian people have been demonized, because they didn't choose the uh, right-wing path to allow Western corporations free run of their economy. Um, and what, what was the justification for the United States Congress to interfere in this, uh, you know, to, to, to butt in in somebody else's business, in another country's business? Well, there's no justification. This, goes, this is not a unique situation. We butt into everybody's ex business all over the world, you know? <laughs> we don't need any justification to say, oh, I'm going to uh, fuck around with you. Yeah, we'll let it this out if we... And they can count on the American public being completely ignorant or indifferent to foreign policy. So basically, they have free reign to do what they want, and no one is paying attention. So go ahead with your story. Um, okay, uh, in 1991, uh, Croatia and Slovenia declared uh, independence, and um, the population of Yugoslavia did not correspond to republic lines. So, for instance, in Croatia, you had a sizable Serbian population. They didn't want to be torn away from Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was their country. They wanted to stay in Yugoslavia. Uh, so you had basically a civil war resulting from people who wanted to secede versus people who wanted to stay in a united, multi-ethnic state. And um, federal, Yugoslav federal army did its best to hold the country together, but uh, 
United States and Western European countries threatened to bomb, uh, well, threatened severe economic sanctions with a hint of bombing if Yugoslav forces continued to try to hold the country together. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Yugoslavia uh, bent under the pressure and you had a successful secession. There was, um, during 1991, late 1991, there was a conference in Yugoslavia organized by the European Union, well, at that time, uh, European community. And um, this was nothing more than a cover for ensuring secession. So um, they basically um, threatened Yugoslav, Yugoslavia and Serbs in this, in this conference that if they didn't agree to secession, they're going to impose more sanctions and so forth. And uh, finally, during this conference, they p intentionally banned Yugoslavia from attending this conference. They said, Yugoslavia cannot attend this conference. So basically, you had secessionists and Western governments sitting at this conference deciding the future fate of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was not allowed to attend this conference on its own fate. So it's, it's predictable that their final decision was, yes, these countries are independent and we recognize them. In 1992, there was, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, another secession movement, and this one, uh, it was clear, had the potential for even greater violence because the population was very intermixed. And you had basically, um, I think about a third of the population was Serb, again, who wanted to stay in Yugoslavia, wanted a multi-ethnic state, and you had uh, Muslims and Croatians who were in, mainly in favor of secession. Uh, in 1992, there was... Um, April 92, I believe it was, there was a, Li a Lisbon agreement that resulted between uh, Bosnian Muslims, Croatians, and Serbs about, uh, uh, it would be an independent state, but the governing structure would be similar to Switzerland, where it would be based on the system of cantons. Um, the leader of the Bosnian Muslims, Ali Izabegovic, um, was encouraged by Warren Zimmer Zimmerman, U.S. Uh, representative, to tear up the paper he had just signed. So he had signed this Lisbon Agreement that meant peace for Bosnia and Herzegovina. U.S. pressured him to renounce his signature, which he did, and war resulted. Bosnian Muslim forces started attacking federal troops throughout the entire territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, they had agreements, uh, and the United States was pressuring Yugoslavia, calling it aggression, that their troops were in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which at that time was Yugoslav territory, and they were being attacked. Uh, Yugoslavia again bent to pressure from the West and uh, started signing agreements with the Bosnian Muslims and Croatians for withdrawal of Yugoslav troops. Um, each several cases, Bosnian Muslim troops violated the agreement. So as soon as Yugoslav troops left the barracks, they were ambushed and many people were massacred. Um, yeah, a civil war in Bosnia and Herzegovina resulted, and of course, NATO troops eventually bombed and. Um, well, we, 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 we see the effect there. It's the people who are driven into misery and uh, poverty and homelessness. And now the next target is, uh, is Yugoslavia itself, or what remains of it, Serbia and Montenegro. And um, that's what this war is about. It's about grabbing another piece, Kosovo, tearing that off. Next target is Montenegro. There are efforts to tear that away. So the president of uh, Montenegro is a Western puppet. He's gotten millions of dollars of aid, and uh, he's announced that in the autumn that he's going to hold a referendum on secession. And we could probably expect uh, stuffed ballots and so forth to ensure the result. Um, so basically, the, what this war is about, why did the uh, United States and uh, NATO bomb Yugoslavia? It's because, well, I couldn't say it better than that one worker did at the power plant. He says that we will not be slaves. That's why they bombed us. We refuse to be slaves. Well, maybe this, uh, thank you for that uh, little thumbnail sketch. Um, I guess this brings us up to the present time. Uh, why don't you uh, share with us your reflections of our, of our trip? I guess we're just a halfway through our trip. We'll be leaving next Saturday. Oh, today's Sunday. So we're a little bit more than, just slightly more than halfway through our trip. Uh, why don't you share, uh, you know, reflections on your trip so far? Oh, it's a bit of an emotional trip for me, and I have to stop myself from crying several times. Um, all my life I've wanted to go to Yugoslavia, and actually last summer I was planning on coming here this summer, but I couldn't have imagined the circumstances that that would have happened. Um, 
It's pretty much as I expected because I've grown up with Yugoslav people. And the incredible warmth of the people is very striking. And it's something I can't, f I'll never forget the warmth of the people. Um, and um, some of the destruction I've seen is, is just terrible, terrible. And I, and I know that some of the worst sights lie ahead of us. So um, I'm wondering how I'm going to handle that emotionally. No, it's not some sort of game. And unfortunately, the West is not done with Yugoslavia, not by any means. Um, they've managed to occupy, impose an occupation on Kosovo. And I think we can look at Bosnia and Herzegovina, what NATO occupation has meant, and we can anticipate similar things for Kosovo. And it's also a picture of what the United States intends to impose on what remains of Yugoslavia, and they're going to use every method they can to impose this on. If we look at Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, in both, under the Dayton Agreement, that consists of two entities, uh, Bos uh, Bo uh, Muslim Croatian Federation and uh, Serb Republic. In both entities, United States officials have written, they've actually written laws for, on privatization and s had it submitted to their assemblies in both entities. So these were written by Western leaders. And uh, the Croatian Muslim Federation, they threatened, off, threatened to cut off all aid if they didn't speed up privatization. Uh, in the Serb Republic, they already had a law on privatization. The Western officials ordered them to scrap that plan and uh, pass this new Western-imposed plan instead. And uh, according to documents from the American Embassy in Sarajevo, this new plan that the Western leaders drew up had an, an advantage over the old plan in that it provided greater opportunities for Western investors to grab the best assets. Um, there's also includes provisions uh, uh, eliminating any chance of expropriation or nationalization of um, companies bought by Western corporations. And these same documents say that uh, this, this presents an opportunity because the, uh, it has a close proximity to Western European markets and they can Western corporations take advantage of this low-cost labor in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is the lowest, they claim, in Central and Eastern Europe. So it's a chance to, to uh, force the people into the third world, and that's the role for all of Yugoslavia, eventually, is to be forced into the third world. It's cheap labor and nothing more, and the products are, can be shipped to Western Europe. Um, in Rambouille, the uh, plan that the U.S. drew up well, had many outrageous provisions, but one provision was that the economy of uh, Kosovo shall function in accordance with free market principles, uh, and that, um, that there'll be a free flow of capital f and so forth from Western corporation countries. Uh, so they, they don't lose any opportunity to work in their own economic interests whatsoever. and. Um, the president of Montenegro, the Western puppet, uh, he's already uh, passed laws on uh, privatization and special benefits for Western corporations, a tax rate of 2.5 percent. Um, yeah, so he's, he's already going in that direction, too, and I think we'll see a secession and we'll see continued pressure and possibly, again, bombing once more. The West will continue its efforts until it makes makes people bend to us will, and once again, these people who have suffered under centuries of colonial oppression will again be under colonial oppression. Well, uh, I guess uh, I, I'm ready to conclude this little interview uh, by asking you the obvious question. As a peace activist, as an American peace activist, what's it going to take to change American foreign policy on this whole thing? <laughs> Overcoming the uh, propaganda onslaught. Uh, unfortunately, during the peace movement, um, I, we had to build a new peace movement because the peace movement we worked with before was completely taken in by propaganda. Uh, I had many people in the peace movement that I worked with for years. Some have told me they're in favor of bombing, if you can imagine such a thing. Others told me, well, they kind of support us, but they're, they don't want to be seen with us because it's not popular. Basically, it's an issue of conformity. Uh, you need to have people who really look at issues and think for themselves and really look at it and not follow the propaganda line. Uh, if we can get a peace movement to grow th with an independent mind, that don't, I think that could change policy. It did it during Vietnam, right? It was big enough to change policy eventually. 
But unfortunately, I don't see at this point of time a willingness to look beyond the propaganda. And we have to overcome the fear of being seen as uh, not conforming to popular opinion. That's absolutely ridiculous. People have to think for themselves. Well, doesn't that, doesn't that imply then that we really need to be looking at the, the development of some kind of alternative media that uh, we could use as, a, as an alternative ideological focus that would enable us to interpret the news in a different kind of way um, and be, to, be, to develop into a norm for the peace movement and others that are interested in the truth? And that's exactly the problem. You're right. Uh, unfortunately, compared to 30 years ago, the number of alternative viewpoints in magazines, newspapers, and so forth has shrunk dramatically. This is a difficult time for alternative media. Uh, so we need to reverse that trend and grow and grow. And uh, as you suggest, that's, that is the key to the whole issue right there. What alternative media there is right now, they're also scared on this issue. And I think they're afraid of losing their readership by taking a, a viewpoint that doesn't conform to the propaganda line. Do you think with the uh, coming of winter or with the uh, when winter comes, the situation will change? A uh, situation in regard to? Well, the situation in regard to the American peace movement or the uh, awareness of uh, the global <sighs> humanitarian conscience. It'll change in that I think they'll be more, even more indifferent. They won't pay any attention, is my guess. Even though people will start dying here? People will start dying. They'll freeze. The, the power won't be available for heating. Well, you know, the heating plant here in Belgrade was bombed. Uh, but who's going to know about it? People in the West are not going to know about it, let alone care. These are... Um, they're worthy victims and unworthy victims, right? So victims who happen to correspond to American policy, those you can care about, victims that don't correspond to American policy, you won't even hear about them. Or if you do, it'll be phrased in such a way that it's uh, very, um, it'd be hard for people to feel humanity of, to the, for those people. Well, I think that that's, you know, Kosovo in a nutshell. I yeah. mean, uh, to uh, vilify the Serbs in Kosovo and to glorify the Albanians as freedom fighters? Yeah, that's exactly the issue. You, know, you have extremely emotional uh, news reports about Kosovo uh, Albanian Kosovo refugees. And now that you have uh, Serb refugees, Ro Roma refugees, uh, Gorans, uh, Egyptians, uh, even pro-Yugoslav Albanian refugees from the K you know ba from KLA violence, um, you hear very little about that. And uh, what you do here is in a very abstract manner. It's, uh, it isn't a show that. Do you uh, do you think you'll do you think that this is just your first trip? Do you think you'll be back in the winter next year? I don't know about the winter because I had to borrow the money to come here in the first place. <laughs> but I know for a fact that, that now that I'm here, I want to come back many more times in my life, and I will. Anything else you'd like to say in conclusion here? No, except that um, I'm with a great group of people, and I feel very honored to be with all these people on this mission.